have a special request this evening. The Dhamma talk is going to be on coping with loss. And a few people are walking out, so but I'm going to cope with the loss of some of the people in here. <laughs> I just usually go to the toilet. Okay, I think most people have settled down now. The topic today coming from a request from someone who, for many people actually, who lost people in their lives. And it is obviously something which will happen to each one of us from time to time. And fortunately the uh, insights which are gained from meditating and finding out how your mind works are very helpful in coping with the loss of a loved one or even a friend and learning how to understand the whole processes involved in in grief to understand them so well that one can work through that time in one's life not just to endure it to get rid of it but also to enrich one's life from the experience of understanding why those emotions come in the first place and also understanding just the meaning of such things as life and death. And of course, one cannot understand the meaning of life without incorporating the event called death. And when one puts those two together and gets a full picture, life has a beautiful meaning. And hopefully I'll uh, enrich your understanding of this life and death process uh, throughout this talk, which I'm giving this evening. But first of all, that there is a whole cocktail of emotions come into one's heart at the time of a, of a loss. And the three of them which I'm going to focus on this evening is the emotion of anger, sadness and uh, fear. Of course, that one could add other emotions as well into that cocktail. But uh, these are three of the main ones which happen when you are faced with a loss of someone. Anger, uh, <coughs> sadness and fear. And the first one of anger is a very common problem in our modern world. And I mention that word modern world simply because in ancient times there was not so much anger. And the reason that one has anger these days, a huge amount of anger, and I think I've mentioned this before in a hall like this, is that because our modern world have encouraged us to be ever more control freaks. To think that by the use of technology, willpower or skillful means that we can control our world more and more and thereby somehow alleviate those things which we don't like to get them out of our lives. And because that we have so much more control, not only can we choose the person we marry but we can also choose when to dump them for somebody else. We can choose our career with more great ease. We can choose which place we want to live in. There's so much we can choose in these days, it gives us the illusion that we're in total control of our lives. And that illusion of control is the root cause of anger in our modern world. Because the more that we think that we're in control of this thing we call my life, the sooner we will come across these brick walls these hurdles which we cannot surmount. And instead of realizing that this is life and we have to accept and let go, instead we have always been used to controlling and getting our own way in the sense that when we come across the hurdles we get frustrated. And we start saying this shouldn't happen, it shouldn't be this way. Why did he die? Why did she die? Why is this happening? There is an anger there which is born of the realization that one cannot really control this life. We can't even control our health. Now, I've been last week been suffering from hay fever. For years I've been trying to get a nose transplant. <laughs> and very often I've said that because I want to be multicultural, first of all I was going to try and get an Aboriginal nose. 
a black nose on a white face, which I thought would be a wonderful um, <laughs> personal sort of expression of harmony, of racial harmony. But unfortunately, that uh, you can get all sorts of other no- transplants, but not nose transplants yet. But if anyone hears of one, please let me know, because I'll be interested. But no matter what you try and do to alleviate the symptoms of sickness and illness, I meditate, I live a healthy lifestyle, but still, sometimes, no matter, even if you've got the best doctors as your friends, it does not matter that sometimes you become sick. Now I mentioned that, and I have to put a rider on that, because whenever I've made a big mistake already by mentioning that I have some physical ailment, so as soon as I mention that, next week everybody comes with their uh, medicine <laughs> and their patent cures for curing me. And they all come up here and say, Ajahn Brahm, you have to take this, it really works. And I have so much medicine that I really get sick by the next week, so please don't do that to me. The point is that you're out of control in this life that sickness sometimes happens, and the same with death. There's a strange thing that with all the knowledge we have, and all the experiences we have of life, why we can't accept that death can happen at any time. And why we don't embrace this fact. When we don't embrace the fact, that's where we get frustrated. We have the unrealistic expectations of life, thinking that we can plan how long we're going to live. Which brings me to my first story, or, as you all know by now, joke. And this is a new one, because this was told to me only a few days ago. There was two men in Perth, old men, they were good friends, and the one thing which they enjoyed more than anything else was going to the Wacker to watch the cricket. They loved cricket so much, and they were looking forward to the Ashes Test coming in a few weeks' time here in Perth. But when they were talking, they were wondering, when you die and you go to heaven, do they play cricket in heaven? And so they had a pact together because they were just so devoted cricket lovers. They said, whoever dies first, the other one will come down and tell them the answer to the question, do you play cricket up in heaven? And sure enough, one person died, and a few weeks later, they came back. He said, I've got two things to tell you, he told his mate. First of all, yes, they do play cricket up in heaven. And number two, I've just been bowled out and you're batting next. (laughs) Which shows you that death comes at any time, (laughs) even when you don't expect it. So the point is that when we can understand the truth of life, and this is part of the reason why you come to places like this, you know, to get closer to the reality of this existence which we have. We tend not to expect what life can't give us. We understand that when we meet someone and fall in love, it won't last forever. We understand that when we have a beautiful time together, that it has a use-by date. That there comes a time that when even our own body will have to be given in. It's as if in those old times when you were boating, put on a rowing boat on a lake, and they would say, number 10, your time is up, come in. And it doesn't matter how much you want to resist and think you're not ready, you cannot put off death. And it's strange that no one, or very few people, are ever ready. If death comes to your door today, you'll always say, I'm not quite ready yet, can you come back tomorrow please? And even tomorrow, you're still not ready. Sometimes I've asked people, how, how long do you want to live for? And some people, when they're in their twenties, say maybe sixty or seventy. It'd be great if I could actually have that in writing, because when they get sixty or seventy, they say, no, 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 eighty. Eighty is long enough. And when they get to eighty, they say, no, 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 ninety please. It's strange that so few people are ready to die. And that's one thing which, as Buddhists, we should always be ready to die. Because when you're ready to die, only then are you ready to live. Because the anger at the misunderstanding of what life is really about, thinking that life will go on forever, is also coupled with a disappointment a disappointment of opportunities wasted, 
of time which has been frittered away when death suddenly comes to you or to your friends. One of the great teachings obviously of death is that we know that life is circumscribed. You only have a few years on this planet and the positive thing which comes out of knowing about a death is to value life even more. And it's a valuing of things Valuing of things like the present moment, of this day, of now, which is one of the most important outcomes, positive outcomes of the experience of death. People who have never known a close friend or relation die can live life as if there was no tomorrow. Actually they don't. They live life as if there were many tomorrows. So they can fit away this moment. And what I mean there is the important things in life, they put off. Whenever we come close to a death, whether it's our own death or somebody else's death, it does change our priorities. When I'm saying that anger is the lack of understanding of reality, the opposite of understanding reality gives us a more fullness of life. Too often the idea of death is considered to be a taboo you're not supposed to talk about it, you're not supposed to even discuss it. And even now, I've mentioned the word death many, many times. In fact, in our Western society, no one dies. They pass on. They go to the other side. They kick the bucket. Anything except saying that they die. We've got so many other words for it, and you wonder why we have so many words for something which is so common. And the reason is because we're afraid and that fear creates the misunderstanding. The misunderstanding thinks that we're in control, we can keep it going. And that leads to the anger when we realize that we're out of control. It's frustration. Why did this happen? And of course the old answer is, why not? I did read many years ago of this lady who was, I think, in her 90s. She was in perfect health all her life, never a sickness. But she went to a checkup and they found she had cancer. And her first response was, why me? Ninety years of age, never a sickness. And now she had cancer. She said, why me? My goodness, lady, why not? You've got away with it for so long. Surely <laughs> it has to catch up with everybody. When we accept the sicknesses of life, then we don't have so much anger at things like death. And when we appreciate what death has to teach us, then we don't get frustrated at it, but we welcome it even. There's this beautiful teaching of the meaning of life. One of those stories in the books, and a story which I tell at most funeral services, which I take, and I take a lot of funeral services. And sometimes that when you take a lot of funeral services and you get close to death, when you deal with people who are grieving, it gives you a different understanding about the whole process. Because I remember one of the stories which I was wrote in the book, because I know that when you do funeral services, people do get angry. And I remember one funeral service when the wife actually came right up to the coffin as I was doing my chanting. It was most disconcerting when she started getting very angry at the coffin and beating on it. You stupid husband, why did you die now? You haven't paid off the mortgage yet. <laughs> Whatever she said. And that happens. But I notice it's the, the anger which can sometimes come up can very easily be assuaged once we come to understand the reality of this thing we call life and death. What it really does is show us the importance of the time we've had together. At the funeral services which I go to, the most important part, and I'm sure that you have seen this, is become more important than any prayers or chanting or anything else of the ceremony, is the eulogies, where people start to talk about the person who's passed away. The reason why I love those eulogies is because in 99% of cases, they're talking about a beautiful human being. They start to tell all the wonderful memories they have of being with that person, of what they really meant, of what a great friend, sometimes what a great cook, 
what a great person they were and how they helped and served and loved and cared. And having been to so many funeral services in my life, I realized that that is what I call the bottom line of a person's life. Using a metaphor from economics, when you judge how your accounts are, your finances, and you have your bottom line, you take the credits and the debits and find out how much is left. This is what I call the bottom line of a person's life. What is said about them when they die? And I've always been very inspired to hear just what really matters. At a death, you find that finances are not important. Possessions are not important. Even your achievements in life aren't important. What's really important is how well you loved your partner, your children, your parents. And what sort of contribution you gave to the emotional life of others. How kind you were. How you were there for others in distress. In your great friendship. That's what I hear again and again and again. And what it teaches me, the lesson of such funerals, it teaches me what's really important in life, what people will remember you by. And if that's what people are going to remember you by when you die, it's what you should work hard on right now. All the other things which we spend so much time on, our arguments, getting our own way, paying the bills, getting on in life, the holidays, the big cars, whatever else you aspire to, to in this life, People won't remember you by that. They remember you by your kindness and goodness. The sorts of things which don't cost money. The sorts of things which take time, which sometimes we are negligent of. Those are the things which count. That's the lesson of death. When you remember somebody, what do you remember them for? What do you want to be remembered for? These are the spiritual values which go across all main traditions. This is what makes life, which makes a human being, which is really important, is what we actually celebrate at a person's death. I know that's a big thing these days in funeral services, celebrating a life. We were doing that for years. I don't know, we may have even initiated that idea. Because when a person dies, instead of thinking, Ah, they've t been taken away from us and feeling the anger and the sadness. Instead, we think of what we've had together. And I please ask your forgiveness for those of you who come here every week, who've been coming here for years, because one of the key stories which I have about how to deal with a loss is a story many of you have heard so many times, the story of the concert. But this was a very moving story for me because this was my own experience of my father's death when I was only 16 years of age and I loved my father so much and imagine what happens to a young boy 16 who loses his dear loved father you'd expect I was devastated you'd expect it would have seriously affected my studies and my life it did seriously affect me but in a very positive way Somehow or other I found another way of looking at the death of a loved one. And I used the simile of the concert. Because as a young man growing up in London, I loved music. I used to listen to all types of music. Folk, rock, jazz, classical. And those of you who have heard me tell this story before would have heard that I heard the first performance of Led Zeppelin in the Marquee Club. Wardour Street, Soho. It's indelibly in my consciousness. The first time they performed when they got their band together. And also, I remember hearing this small band in a pub in north of London. I used to go to pubs and drink beer. I was not born as a monk. <laughs> I had to learn. And on that occasion, only six people turned up Myself and my brother were two of those. And I was so pleased that the band actually played. 
And imagine in a small room, maybe the size of our reception area there, that's all. But the lead singer later became quite famous. His name is Rod Stewart. So in those days, he's just sitting as far as, you know, the, the maybe four or five feet in front. I really loved those days, and I still remember those concerts. I think I mentioned this to Liam Bartlett, and I got his eyes big, because somehow I love it, he likes rock music and the doors. I remember going to the roundhouse in Chalk Farm, see two hours of the doors, followed by two hours of Jefferson Airplane, another two hours of doors, followed by another two hours of Jefferson Airplane, an all-night concert. That was really neat. But anyhow, after those great performances, when everybody had finished, when the band packed up their instruments and went home, and I also had to go home. For those of you who have been to London, in my memory anyway, it's always raining. At night time it's always dark, cold and incredibly gloomy. And that's how I remember after the concert's finished, going out into the dark, gloom, cold London night. But never once do I remember myself crying after a great concert. Never once do I remember feeling sad. After a great performance, all I ever thought was how privileged I was to have been there at the time. How lucky. And I remembered that music all the way home. Remembered it years afterwards. With joy, never sadness. And that's exactly how I felt on my father's death. It was the end of a great concert. I never felt sad that he had died. I felt privileged that he had lived. And I'd been there with him for 16 years. In my heart was the feeling, what a great performance that was. Thank you. It was different than sadness. It was an appreciation. It was an appreciation of a life. And it was such a wonderful 16 years. I felt so grateful that I've never shed a tear of such a great man's life. Different way of looking. I understood even then that all beings must someday die. And I understand that concerts will end. And I also understand that next week there will be another band coming to play. And I enjoyed every one of those bands. Sometimes when we attach to one person in our life, we attach them very much and we invest too much in one person. And sometimes it's beyond us to think that when they go there might be somebody else. It may not be another lover but a friend, an, uh, an acquaintance, someone we too can share our life with because as human beings that's what we do, We're always sharing our time together. It becomes a wonderful thing. Not one concert, but many concerts in our life. And each one enriches us. That way, the anger turns not to sadness, but turns to a, all I can say is one of these beautiful sweet and sour curries. Sure, there's some sorrow there, but there's also something very beautiful and sweet, an understanding of what life truly is. It's the same as the feeling of watching a sunset on the Indian Ocean. End of a day. But what a beautiful time that was. And it goes out with these beautiful colours, the pinks and the crimsons and the deep reds over the western horizon. The same way when a person dies. And you hear the things said about them, what they did and what they meant to so many people. The beautiful sunset before the sun fades away. Darkness comes, but you know, a new dawn is only a few minutes away. This is our life. And that idea of the circular nature of life, of people coming and going and coming again and going again, of days and nights, of seasons rolling, there is a certain beauty to that once we can stand back and see the whole thing. 
too often in life we just focus too narrowly just on the event of a death. We forget about the whole of life. We can only see the whole picture. Not just what's been taken away, but what we've had. Not just the pain of the last few moments, but just the whole journey and what lies beyond. There is something beautiful there. As one person once said, when a person dies and you go to their funeral service, sometimes it was like in the old days where you go to, say, the pier at Fremantle and wave off one of our loved ones as they're going on the, the ship on a long journey overseas. You stand on the dock and wave them off as they cast anchor and sail away. You watch them as the ship grows smaller and smaller until you can hardly see the passengers, just the shape of the ship. And you carry on gazing until that ship finally reaches the horizon. Just a speck, but you know your loved one is there. And finally it just goes that last little distance beyond the horizon. And you can see them no more. You can see them no more, but somehow you know they're there somewhere. They've just gone out of sight, that's all. All religions understand that there is something beyond death. And in Buddhism we can actually find that out through the deep practices of meditation. But all religions feel that there's something there afterwards. It's for you to find out. That's why religions, they have a mystery to them. There's always a mystery you can uncover. Which brings me on to another story which I told in Armadale group on Tuesday night by request. I have told this story here but I think it was on a New Year's Eve night. It was a story of a man who was trekking in Nepal in the Himalayas with a group, with a leader but because he was lingering, taking photographs he lost the group and lost his way and wandered for hours completely out of his surroundings lost in the mountains of the Himalayas in Nepal. And fortunately as the night came he managed to see an old Buddhist monastery. He knocked on the door, the monks led him in. He asked the abbot if he could stay the night because he was completely lost. And of course, being kind, the abbot said, sure. And he showed him to a room, gave him a bed and wished him good night. But maybe because of his tiredness or because of the excitement of the day, he could hardly go asleep. And it was at midnight that he heard this sound. It's very difficult to describe exactly what he heard because it was so beautiful and otherworldly. It was like chanting and music all combined. It was so entrancing he had to listen. It was the most beautiful thing he'd ever heard in his old existence. And he couldn't wait for the morning to ask the abbot. At midnight he said, I heard this amazing sound. It was so beautiful and wonderful. What was it? And the abbot said, oh that, I'm sorry, that's a secret. Only monks can understand what that sound came from. I can't tell you because you're not a monk. And he was very disappointed. But he understood this was some protocol in these monasteries. And so he thanked the abbot, had breakfast and then left with a guide and soon found his way back. For the years that followed, he could never forget that magical sound. He remembered it and after about three years he could not stop his curiosity. He went back to that place in the Himalayas. He found that monastery. He knocked on the door again and said, look, I just cannot get that sound out of my head. I have to know what that sound was. And the abbot said, look sir, I told you last time, I cannot tell you because you're not a monk. Yes, I know, he said, so I want to be a monk. And the abbot said it takes seven years 
before we can ordain you as a monk and let you into this secret. Doesn't matter, he said. I'm going crazy thinking about this sound. I have to know it. Seven years is a small amount of time to find out the secret of this amazing, beautiful, charming sound. So, he was put into training. Seven years he worked hard, he studied the scriptures, he meditated, until after seven years he got his ordination in a huge ceremony, because it's rare that Westerners can actually ordain in this monastery. And at the end of the ceremony, of course, the first thing he asked the abbot, now I'm a monk, tell me what that sound is. It had been bugging him for ten years and now he could find the answer. The abbot said, this evening, Come to my room at quarter to midnight and I will show you. Of course, he was so excited. At last, after ten years, he would find the answer. He was there at half past eleven, waiting. The abbot let him in. At five minutes to midnight, the abbot took a bunch of keys from his desk. Follow me, he said. And they went to a very remote corner of that monastery where there's a big wooden door usually kept closed. The abbot took out a wooden key put it in the lock and turned it and as the door opened the visitor, the new monk started to hear the music again. The music which had enchanted him and entranced him and led him on this great journey to this monastery seven years training now he was going to find out what was causing this amazing, beautiful sound. As they walked down the corridor, they came to another iron door. And the abbot got out the iron key. And he put it in the lock, turned it and opened it. And now you could hear the music even more clear. They went a bit further and came to a silver door. And there he took out the silver key and opened the silver door. And now the noise, the, ch- the sound was so entrancing and charming, he was almost there. It was just the final door. This amazing gold door with jewels embedded into its surface. You could see the light of something supernatural on the other side, coming through the cracks. And the abbot finally got out the last key, the gold key, put it in the door, and slowly opened it. And there he saw the source of this most beautiful and wonderful and charming sound. It was worth all those years of waiting to see this. You know what it was? I'm sorry, I can't tell you because you're not monks. I'm sure you saw that coming, did you? (laughs) But there's some mystery (laughs) which is very hard for you to find out. And sometimes the mystery of death is like that as well. But you know that sometimes that people actually do come back and tell the story. Sometimes you don't believe them. But If you want to believe me, and many of you can trust me, you know sort of me for a long time, I don't tell lies, that death is a very pleasant experience. Sometimes people wonder, you know, why is it that people are so afraid of something which is actually very nice? Getting up to death, dying is sometimes not so pleasant, but death itself is one of the most beautiful experiences you can have. For those who don't believe me, I usually quote... uh, an article which was actually written by um, it was Graham Edwards. He was this senator, I'm not sure if he's still a senator, but uh, you may remember him. He's in a wheelchair. He really fought hard for veterans' rights and disabled people's rights because he was a soldier in the Vietnam War, serving in the Australian Army. They were in a firefight. He went to help one of his friends, and he stepped on a landmine and blew off his legs. He was a casualty of landmines. But he described the story of what happened. He said, there was this huge explosion, this blinding light, 
an incredible pain for about a second or two. That's all it lasted. And the next thing he knew, and I always remember these words in the article, the next thing he said, he was floating above the paddy fields of Vietnam without a care in the world. The most beautiful, peaceful feeling he'd ever known. And he didn't know how long he was out of his body, dead, peacefully floating. But a thought came to his mind, and the thought was of his wife back here in Perth, who had recently given birth to his first child. And that thought was accompanied by, I cannot leave her now. And that brought him back into his body. And as soon as he entered his body again, there was this incredible pain, followed almost immediately by unconsciousness. The next thing he knew was waking up in the military hospital, starting the road to recovery. The reason I mentioned that story was, he's not a Buddhist, he's not a sort of, I don't know what religion he is, but that was a personal experience of what happens. And it's very similar to other experiences people have. It's what happens when you die. The dying process can be very burdensome and heavy as your body is wearing out. But when that process is finished and you do die, it's always very peaceful, very pleasant, and very full of ease. It's good to know that. You don't need to be a monk to know that one. You need to be a monk to know the, so the source of that sound. <laughs> But to be, know what happens at death. That's all you need to know. What that does, that stops the fear coming from death. Because sometimes the fear of death is, oh, such a terrible thing, that death needs to have a PR makeover. The moment we think, oh, it's terrible when you're dying, and because of that, you say that your friend has died, and say, oh, I'm terribly sorry to hear that. What do you mean you're sorry to hear that? You never even knew that person. Because we say it's sorry, it's sad, because we think that way, it's got into our psyche that death is very bad, it's not true. That sometimes dying is a great relief. It's a peaceful experience. And it also teaches us. It teaches us again, as I said earlier, just how to let go of things. It teaches us the meaning of life and the time we have here. It's the dead people teaches that life is not going to go on forever, to make sure you're doing the right thing now, so when you die, you don't leave any unfinished business. The teaching of death means you cannot get angry at anybody. If you live life thinking you're going to die this evening, which is a practice which monks use, it's our reflection on death, is saying we can die any time, we really take that seriously, so there's no time to be angry at anybody, because if you get angry at anybody, you haven't got time to say sorry. That's what I thought anyway, because I said I love my dad. But being a young man, a teenager, you're actually, I know the psychology now of teenager, you're trying to be independent. Whatever your father says, you say the opposite. It's just what a teenager does. I told this story today in our monastery. It's a, the Middle Eastern story of this young man who was helping his father in the salt business. His father would load up the donkeys with salt and take them to other villages and towns to sell. And so, knowing his son was a teenager, was about 16, whenever the donkey was leaning to the left, the father would say, Son, push the donkey to the left. Because whatever the father said, the young man would do the opposite, and thereby push the donkey to the right, and therefore the donkey would be balanced. If the donkey was leading to the right, he would say, push it to the right, and the young man would push it to the left. And then what you call these days reverse psychology. But it would always work. But then one day the donkeys were crossing a narrow bridge, the donkey was leading to the left, and he told his son, push it to the left, and this time the young man did push it to the left. The donkey fell in and died and lost all the salt. And the father was very upset. He said, look, why did you do that? Every time I say push it to the left, you push it to the right. Every time I say push it to the right, you push it to the left. What's wrong? And the son said, father, didn't you know today was my 18th birthday? I'm not a kid anymore. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I was like that as a teenager as well. Whatever my father said, you do the opposite because that's tradition. <laughs> teenage tradition. But when my father died, I never had the chance to say sorry. And that's one thing I do remember from the funeral service. When somebody dies, especially, it wasn't really unexpected, he was very sick for a long time. But even so, or maybe I wasn't old enough, I never matured enough to say to a person how much you loved them and cared for them. And also to say sorry for all those things which you did. You never meant to do those things, but they did irritate my father, I'm sure. But as a Buddhist, I know you can say sorry. I notice that one of the difficult things about loss is you cannot express your love to that person in the same way you could before. Before you can always give them a hug, be them a kiss, or just be with them and say how much you care for them. And that's one of the most difficult things at a loss. People think that that ex way of expression has been removed from you. I know it's not removed anymore. Very often at funeral services we do forgiveness ceremonies. Where we think of that person and say sorry. You imagine that person as if they were right there in front of you. And imagine what they would say. One of the most beautiful forgiveness ceremonies I saw many, many years ago was when a, one of the Cambodian, the senior Cambodian members of the Perth Buddhist community invited the monks for an alms offering in his house. And while we were doing the chanting, he came to the front. His story was as follows. Like many Cambodians during the time of the killing fields, he, with his wife, made the very dangerous journey over the mountains and jungles of the Thai-Cambodian border to the refugee camp just inside Thailand. Any of you who have seen that movie, The Killing Fields, would recognize the, the journey. He made that journey. They both survived the journey. Many people didn't. But just as they got in the refugee camp, they found the wife had contracted malaria in the jungles. No matter what medicines they gave her, she died. It was such a sad thing that almost made it to freedom. And she died on the last part of the journey. She made it to Thailand, but with malaria, which was fatal. As a refugee, he had no time to mourn, no time to do the proper services. And so, years later, when he came to Perth, when he'd established himself, had a house, and had a new wife, this service was for his old wife. With his new wife watching, he took out from the, his shirt pocket this old picture of his wife, of his first wife, the only one he had. It was literally dog-eared and creased. He carried it all the way, over the mountains, through the refugee camp, into Australia. The only memory he had of the first wife he loved. He took it out, he put it in front of him, and during the whole time the monks were chanting, he wept, cried, and he's made his peace with the past. That photo was all he needed to bring back that person into his heart. It was a very beautiful ceremony of letting go, acknowledging the past, and moving forward into the future. Because after the weeping and the chanting were finished, he went back and sat next to his wife of the present. Sometimes we do need to do those little ceremonies, those little forgiveness acknowledging ceremonies when someone has passed away. How you do that is as follows. You find something that that person who died would have liked would have liked you to do, whether it's a donation, a charity, or whatever it is, and you do it for them. 
not for you, but for them. You do an act of giving, giving yourself out of love for the one who's passed away. Because I recognize this a long time ago, that we can experience love. We know what it feels like. We should also recognize how we express our love to each other. And the way we express our love is not with the hugs and kisses as much as with the gifts we give one another. At a birthday, at Christmas, at Valentine's Day, or any other time of the year, you express your love for your children, for your parents, for your husband, for your wife, by giving. It's the giving which is so connected with love, with care, but when you recognize that connection, that is how you can express your love beyond the grave. You give for them. Not give to them, but give for them. Do something which they would like, would appreciate, would be inspired by, in their memory. And that's such a common thing these days, but it needs to be made more of, because that's one of the wonderful ways of moving beyond the grief and the sadness. In the grief and sadness we feel so disempowered. There's nothing we can do. We need to know that we can do something. Instead of sitting there crying and weeping and feeling sorry, think of what that person would have wanted, what they would have liked. It may be their unfinished business, some of the things which they would have wanted you to do and do it for them as a gift of love. When you do things like that, you understand that the person is never fully gone. There's always something left in you from the time you've had together. And I'm not just saying that to make people feel good. What is a person anyway? It's not just their body. Body changes and you see them in the coffin and then they're buried and eaten by the worms or they're burnt and you just see the cinders afterwards. You wonder, was that the person? When you've touched a dead body, when you've handled it, you know that's not the person, that's their vehicle. The person is something much more intangible and some of that intangibility will always stay with you the one who knows them. Much of my father is with me. My mother, my friends, the people who've taught me. They're never fully gone. They're in there with you. And you express them by giving what they would want. That way, you're actually doing something. You're no longer disempowered. The loss of a loved one it's not a loss of frustration, not being able to express what's still in your heart. So, the summary of the talk which I've given this evening. Anger is always not understanding the reality of life. Not understanding that we can die at any time. There's nothing you can do about this except to flow with it leave it alone, let it be, and learn by these things. And of course what you learn is the value of every day, of every moment. Because this is what you hear at the funeral services and the eulogies. That which is really important. And you don't need to have fear of death. Because people who have come back to tell the tale will say it's a peaceful time. Your old body is worn out. Or even it's a young body it's sometimes in pain. It cannot be maintained any longer. Please let it go. If you believe in Buddhism and reincarnation, you can have another body next time. Maybe an even better body. That's why I always give the simile of a car. If you have a car, if you have a good insurance policy, it means if your car gets in a crash or it wears out, you can get a new car afterwards. And if you've kept up your premiums, you can get a better car than before. What we mean here 
is the premiums is making lots of good karma. If you made lots of good karma and kept up your subscriptions to the Buddhist society, <laughs> then if you die, you get even better car the next time. <laughs> and it's true if you've been not not talking about subscriptions. If you've been a good person, a kind person, made lots of good karma. Of course, you don't need to be afraid of losing this body. You get a much better one next time because it makes a lot of sense. It feels good. It's like justice. You deserve an even better life next time because you've earned it. So you don't need to be afraid or upset. It gives the meaning of life. Without death, we'd never understand the meaning of life. We understand what's really important. That's why death can be beautiful. We don't need to be afraid. It's not a bad thing. What you should really be afraid of is living forever. Imagine that. Seventy, eighty years of age, more nursing homes. Did I tell that joke last week about the two old people, eighty? I think I did, didn't I? About I feel like a newborn baby. Did I not? Okay, well here it comes again. <laughs> if I did. These two old men, and they were sitting there enjoying the sunshine. One was 80 years of age that day. And he turned to his mate who was of a similar age and said, Sam, I'm 80 years old today and I feel terrible. I ache all over. It's just so hard even just to stand up and walk a few steps. I feel terrible at 80. How do you feel? You're about the same age as me. And his friend Sam smiled and said, Actually, I feel like a newborn baby. How's that? said the old man sitting next to him, whose birthday it was. How can you feel like an old, a newborn baby when I feel so awful? And his friend Sam said, Well, just like a newborn baby, I've got no hair, I've got no teeth, and I think I've just wet my pants. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't tell that joke last week. So do you really want to get old like that? <laughs> so death isn't all that bad. It just got a bad PR rap, that's all. It needs a better spin from monks like me. So it's a relief from the pains and difficulties of old age. And just like the end of the day, it's always going to be followed by another dawn. A different time, a different place. And don't be afraid of your death. It's often a great relief. And also when somebody else dies, please understand they're going to die now. Give them permission to die and give yourself permission to live. That way we flow with the truth of life. We never get angry because we don't understand what's obvious. And then we can always, if we feel sad about the person who's gone, we can still give for them. Give in their memory. Whatever that giving is, even if it's just being kind to the children who are left behind, looking after the parents, doing something which they would be proud of, they would like you to do. You don't do it for you, but you do it for them. Because when you give, you are still loving. And when you're loving still, the other person hasn't really gone. So that's how we can deal with the losses in life in a beautiful way, in a positive way, which stops the tears but makes something beautiful grow from the ashes of a dead loved one. Thank you. Okay, has anyone got any comments about the talk this evening? There's no questions from the living. Any questions from the ghosts? <laughs> Many comments or questions? Going, going, going. Oh, you got a question? Yeah, thank you, Baba. <laughs> the anticipation at the end was killing you of that story I told. Well, if you really want to find out the answer, yeah. <laughs> okay.
Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. I have to become a monk. Sama Sambuddha Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawandang Abhiwa Demi Sawakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Sukhati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sankhana Mami. <laughs> <laughs> 